Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the International Book Show. This is the Virtual Book Tour April 2024 edition. I am the host of the International Book Show. My name is McConnell Sankofa. As well as being the host of the International Book Show, I am also the author of four books, The Rise of Rastafari, Life in Gambia, Experiences of Living Across Africa, and How to Market and Sell Your Book. Welcome. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, the International Book Show is a show that happens every single month. It happens on the last Sunday of each month. Um, we're coming up to the fourth year anniversary now. It will be four years um, that I launched the International Book Show. Um, it's changed names over the course of, course of time. It's previously been known as the Black Book Show and the Black Books Webinar, but it's now the International Book Show. It uh, launched four, almost four years ago now. Um, May will, will be the fourth anniversary. Um, and as I mentioned, it happens on the last Sunday each month. And you hear, uh, you'll be hearing from a variety of different talented authors who have written books on a wide range of different subjects. Um, on this particular show, most of the authors will be speaking for about 15 minutes and they'll be giving you a preview of what their book is about. We have some fantastic authors that are ready to educate, inspire and entertain you on this episode of the International Virtual Book Tour, April 2024. Um, just some house rules I'm going to say to begin with. Please, if you're not speaking, please can you mute yourself so we don't hear any background noise. Um, it's up to you whether you want to have guys, whether, whether you want to have your cameras on and off. Normally when I'm not speaking, I have my camera off. Um, but again, it's up to you. Authors, please remember to mention where your book is available to be purchased from. Um, you know, put it on the Zoom link, but there's also people that are going to be watching the show on Facebook and it's also recorded. So people are going to watch the recording on YouTube. So bear that in mind as well when you're you're mentioning your book. Don't, don't just say, I'm going to put my link in Zoom. Obviously, do put your link in the Zoom chat, but also say, you know, I am da -da 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 -da, this is where my book is available from. Um, you know, so people know, you know, where they can get a copy of your book. The people that are also via Facebook and, and, and via YouTube. So without any further ado, I'm going to kick things off with the first author. Um, the first author is Daniela Mason, and she's author of the book called The N-Word. So Daniela, um, please welcome to the International Book Show. Um, she's featured on the International Book Show on the radio show and podcast, um, and she gave a really, really great interview. Um, but now she's featuring on the Virtual Book Tour. So welcome onto the Virtual Book Tour. Please start by just saying, you know, where you're based, a very brief introduction about yourself, and then tell us, you know, all about the book you've written, please. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you, McConnell, for having me here this evening. And uh, it's great to be here. It's a pleasure and a privilege to share with you my book and also to listen to you uh, speak about yours. So about me, I'm a London-based writer. I have been a social cause writer for over 20 years. Um, and during that time, I've carved out a reputation for writing about um, social injustices and exposing injustice. Um, I also write about issues that typically are either overlooked by Western media or are reported with the narrative of a Western media bias. Um, so in 2009, after finishing uh, my master's degree, I wrote an article called Black Women and Hip Hop that went viral. And that article series exposed R. Kelly, um, which was not popular at the time. I received um, death threats, I received hate mail, I received litigation letters, um, but it did in time um, sort of carve out my place as someone who is uh, very passionate about exposing social injustice and injustice in general, um, particularly within the diaspora. Um, shortly afterwards, I wrote a piece about Sarah Reed, the prison death of Sarah Reed and the wrongful imprisonment of Sianda and Gaza. Today, I am a columnist um, and I am editor of Social Cause Affairs for an online newspaper called Black Wall Street Media. So um, I'm also now an author, having just launched uh, my book, The N Word, which has been published by Austin Macaulay. And um, I just recently had the book launch. I'm actually going to begin by sharing with you a short video of my book launch.
So uh, Jackie Mason is a black and right center activist. She certainly puts her money where her mouth is. She notably exposed R. Kelly in 2009. I don't know about that. Can you give that one? With a very remarkable theory from black women in the world, she is an editor of the social issues and colonies of the black Wall Street media. A founding member of the Latin Awards and a champion of the benefit of abuse charity, straight within the foundation. So, I want you to be all of your energy and bring this woman that is the woman of the night, Daniela. Yes, now, it was important to me when putting this evening together that this will to be about the community because. The good is about community. The good is about the progression, upliftment, and the, the advancement of our community, our vocal community, our diaspora. The good is about legacy. It's about the next generation and making the investment into their spiritual and mental well being. It's about the shoulders that we stand upon. We must try to end by paying tribute to the humanity that has been denied for us for centuries. To so honor the ancestors who suffered and strive just to be counted as humans, we are very pleased to have achieved an abundance to fight the agenda. We have done so standing in the footsteps of our ancestors who suffered not in vain so that we may stand proudly before all and say, We are people worthy of that clear respect and cease to settle for the end of it. I'm a big rock soldier. Walking in black on the church, hair smooth like a rose, and sun like babies. Black Smith, when it comes to the black words, black matter at all, studying the next four years, you can't be the black of them. We 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 can't be the I'm sure when Daniela really writes in this book, you must have had the pain of trying you know, to articulate something that is so profound and dehumanization. But you have to do it. If once my brothers and sisters get their heads down, leave my head to it, next time. And I've come to be conscious of the young culture for God made them longer. Right now, I felt this way. It won't be easy. I can't lie. You put up with the Thank you for taking the time to give me Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so in terms of why I wrote the N-word, it is the filthiest, dirtiest, nastiest word in the English language. Those were the words of prosecutor Christopher Darden when the issue of saying the N-word came up in the 1995 murder trial of the now late O.J. Simpson. 25 years later, Judge Stephen Reinhardt described it as the most noxious racial epithet in the contemporary lexicon. Some time ago, the, NS the NAACP held a mock funeral procession in Detroit in a symbolic burial of the N-word as an effort to persuade the diaspora to stop using the slur in hip hop, music, comedy, and casual conversation. Around that time, I was teaching in a London school and the eight to 10 year olds I was teaching used the N-word constantly in conversation with each other, when referencing themselves and others, and they also imbibed the word constantly in their music choices. And this got me thinking. I, I analyzed the word holistically, politically, psychologically, historically, colloquially, as a celebrity accessory, as a street idiom, 
um, and as a weapon of destruction. And I wrote this book to address the ongoing debate surrounding the most loaded word of our global community. Can it be rebranded or should it be erased? I wrote this book to take my readers on a roller coaster journey into the modern ubiquity of a blood soaked word that is so damaging to our souls and psyches. So what the N word explores, the N word focuses on several layers. Um, and I believe one of the most important is the psychology of cruelty. So in the early nineties, um, some of us, many of us, uh, the world stood by and witnessed the massacre in Rwanda. And when Hutu leaders took power in Rwanda, the government began to spread a message of hatred against the Tutsis, using extremists on the radio to call upon the Hutus to attack the, and kill the Tutsis, who they called cockroaches. And as this characterization, this one word, grew among the Hutus, it essentially stripped away any moral obligation to see Tutsis as fellow human beings. And the result was a million dead. That is the power of propaganda through a single word. The Tutsis do not now call themselves cockroaches. During the Holocaust, Nazis referred to Jews with a word that they abandoned after the Holocaust. For every oppressor, it's important to define and describe dehumanization with words because that is what opens the, the process um, and opens the door for cruelty. But once the people have been successfully rebranded, um, given a new term, a subhuman terminology, the process to liberate aggression and exclude the target of aggression from the moral community can thrive. I don't know how many of the viewers or the or my fellow authors on the show tonight watched Game of Thrones, but if you did, you will remember there was a character called Theon Greyjoy. Theon was tortured, flayed, castrated by a character called Ramsay. Um, but part of that process was Ramsay forced him to rename himself Reek. And at the point at which Theon willingly called himself Reek, Ramsay knew he had won the complete psychological battle against this individual. The language has always been a vital element in the enslavement of bodies and minds. So if you can convince an entire people to abandon their titles, and we're now living in a time, right, where people are literally choosing the titles they want to be addressed with and replace them with one that denotes them as subhuman, then the oppressor is able to achieve uh, full possession. I explore some of the excuses that often come up um, when I'm in a debate about the N-word, um, including the spelling, the spelling of the N-word with an A on the end instead of an E-R. And um, what I always say is that the, the, the change of spelling changes the appearance of the word. It doesn't alter the meaning of the word or the etymology or history of the word. In America, uh, they spell the word gray with an A and in England, we spell it with an E, but they are two different spellings of the exact same word. So my book essentially presents a case against the word, the N word. Um, and my argument is that the N-word is not a word that can be used lightly or without gravitas. It's something I feel that it's important for our community to talk about, to discuss, especially for the next generation who, who are using that word a lot more than my gen and my peers did. Um, it's an assault weapon. It has to be loaded, lined up, aligned with the target and shot to make a mark. It doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't exist in a vacuum, which is why in researching this book, I found so many instances of past and present where the N word was used right before a murder or a racist attack or a lynching took place. Every week there are examples of the N word being used as a weapon of choice in instances where people are shortly thereafter injured or killed. It's a, 
single word so powerful that people have lost and do lose their lives due to the beliefs that are encapsulated within it. And that's what makes it what we call a true ethnofallism. So when we say it's just a word, we are undermining the vast power of words, which cannot exist without context. As writers, we understand the power that words hold. Without words, propaganda can't be formulated. Oppression based on race, gender, ability, sexuality, religion, class, all began as expressions of hatred using words. And in America, in Europe, in Africa, in the UK, this is a word that still sits at the center of anti-Black distortions. So I wrote this book um, to really put across the case that there is no redemption to be found in this word. I wrote my book to pay tribute to the humanity that has been denied to black people for centuries, to honor the ancestors who suffered at the hands of dehumanization while striving to be more than chattel, possession, subhuman, N words. And I wrote it to assert to those who say that the word has been rebranded and reappropriated and revamped, then it cannot be. In 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood up in Washington, D.C. and proclaimed that he had a dream. And I can wager that his dream did not include the possibility that some 60 years later, the N-word would still be alive and kicking. I feel it's our community responsibility to bolster education and awareness about the offensiveness and the self-harm of the word across racial and generational, generational lines. My book is available on Amazon Worldwide. Uh, in the UK, it's available in WH Smiths. It's available in Waterstones and Foils. And in the USA, it's available in Barnes and Noble. Uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for listening. It's been a privilege to speak today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Daniela Mason. Um, please um, put the link of where your book is available to be purchased um, I will in, do. in the Zoom chat. Um, I'm just going to do a screen share now. Just bear with me. So I'm just going to share it on the screen as well. Thank you. So everyone should be able to see this on screen. Um, the N-Word by Daniela Mason. Um, places to buy the book, Amazon, uh, the Book Depository, Barnes & Noble, uh, Dymox, Wheelers, Foils, Waterstones, WH Smith, and also from Nubi Nigis Books, uh, Sister Legit. So I'm just going to leave this on for just a little bit longer, just so um, people, if you're, if you're writing it down, for example, or you can actually, if you've got a phone, you can actually take a screenshot um, picture as well. So I'm just going to leave this just so, for a little bit longer so that people... Um, yeah, people can write it down or take a picture, etc. So it's it's available. Feel free to leave comments um, of the International Book Show, leave comments of what you're thinking of the show, um, and I will have a look at those questions. So if you're joining us um, in Zoom, obviously the Zoom chat is the place to go to leave comments. Um, authors, after you've spoken, remember as well to put your the links to where your book's available to be purchased from um, in the Zoom chat as well. Right, I'm now going to go on to the next speaker, author. The next speaker is Kevin Bennett. So welcome on to the Black Book Show, Kevin Bennett. I recently interviewed him for uh, the International Book Show. Uh, I recently interviewed him for my radio show and podcast. That will be coming out very, very soon. Uh, but this afternoon, he'll be talking about, well, this afternoon in England, um, he'll be talking about um, his book. So Kevin Bennett, um, welcome. Please tell us, you know, start by saying where you're based, a brief introduction about yourself, and then tell us all about the book the book you've written, please. Th thank you for having me. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're all good. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, I want to just share with you that what you're doing is absolutely phenomenal. I really appreciate the fact that you're bringing different authors together 
to share their experience from a global perspective because I believe writing a book is also a point of view of legacy as well for all of us, just our view in the world um, to make adjustments in the world of rules. So I think it's absolutely fundamental um, and powerful what you're doing. So congratulations on that. I really appreciate you. Now, my name is Kevin Bennett. Uh, my title is a mental and emotional strategist. That means anything to do with the mind and emotions, that's what I focus on. That's what I specialize in. And it was interesting how I got into it. Um, I come from Brixton, Stockholm Park State, London, England. And growing up, I saw massive trauma. And I experienced massive trauma as well. You know, I've been stabbed on four different occasions. I died on the operating table. Uh, one of the times, obviously, resuscitated. I've had a brother that was shot and killed. I've had another sibling that's died. I had two more siblings that, that died. I had a son that passed away as well. And a lot of my friends ended up either um, in all different types of situations, in prison, dead, uh, you know, all different situations that was really painful to observe and watch. And from a young age, I wanted to understand what makes people do what they do where does trauma come from? Um, how does trauma control your mind, control your emotions, control your behavior? How does it control your environment? So I started to, over time, collaborate and collect with a number of um, different mentors globally. I started to travel to over 25 countries just looking at human behavior. But something interesting happened in my adventures of looking at human behavior, studying human beings for over 10 years, just simply sitting there, observing people, watching them. And then I started to interview people and something kept on reoccurring over and over again. Naturally in your questions, you'll ask, what do you do? How long you've been doing it for? Um, what makes you tick? And all the questions you'll ask. But something started to happen after a period of time, which I found very interesting. Occupations that I started to see people with certain occupations, they all had certain things in common. So for example, I started to see the fact that doctors were very depressed and I found that interesting. I was like, why are doctors depressed? Cause naturally we'll look at a doctor and we'll think, you know, just without thinking about what they do, you know, you're a doctor, you've got a title, you're powerful, you're making money, you're successful. But there was something a lot more sinister that was happening underneath their titles. Then I started to look at anaesthetists. I started to look at dentists and it just got wider and wider and wider. I'm gonna share my screen with you and just break it down a bit more. Um, let's see if I can get this up and running okay. Let's see if we're good with this. Let me share screen. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, can you see my my screen okay? Yes, we can. Yep, okay, brilliant, all right. Okay, so what I, what I started to see is the fact that different occupations were vibrating in different frequencies. So I started to see that you had occupations that was vib vibrating in the frequency of electrons. So you had like people that was vibrating in the electron zone and frequencies that was vibrating in the electron zone. And I'll show you how it's measured shortly as well. And then you had occupations that was vibrating in a proton state, a proton frequency. Now, occupations and people, you know, vibrate in, in the same way. Yeah. So what I started to look at, and I became very interested in it, I spent over 10 years just looking at how, why, how it's happening, why it's happening, and what is actually happening itself. So let me go a bit deeper into it so it makes a bit more sense. So when you look at it, right, now we all have our different beliefs. You know, some of us call it the most high, some of us call, you know, call it God. We have all different names for, and some of us are just atheists, but we have different names for God. I, I, call, I call it God, and that's my thing, right? Now, we're all made out of atoms. Inside of an atom, you have protons, you have electrons, you have neutrons, you have quarks, you have photons. But I just wanted to focus on three. I wanted to focus on three constituents. And the three constituents were protons, positive energy, a positive state, 
neutrons, neutral energy, and electrons, electron energy, negative energy. Now, when you're in a proton state, that's like switching the lights on. You're in a positive state. You're in a positive place. Now, being in that positive energy, that positive state, you're in what they call the spiritual consciousness of love. You're open. You're like an open flower. Now, for most people, they think that the opposite of um, love is hate. And it's, it's far from that. The opposite of love actually turns out to be fear. So what was happening is a lot of the people I, I was, you know, interviewing concerning their career, I wanted to then, I, I started to change the questions and change the focus. And I wanted to look at, did you go into your occupation because of the consciousness of love? Or did you go into your occupation because there's fear that's happening in your life? And it was interesting because I started to look into their childhood and the majority of people stepped into their occupation because of fear. And I'm going to go a bit deeper to explain. So when you're in a, a proton state of love, you're going through the feelings and emotions that you're going through. You're going through um, happiness. You're going through passion. You're going through joy. Overall, you feel positive. You feel enthusiasm. You feel gratitude. You express grat gratitude overall. But when you're going through uh, the, the spiritual entities of fear, you tend to go through burnout, loneliness, you feel hurt, you feel rejected, anxiety, insecurity, you feel disappointed, you feel doubt, you feel grief, you feel guilt. There's all these different um, emotional and, and emotional states that you go through overall. And so I wanted to then put them into levels what is the highest level and what is the lowest level? Now, I used to believe that the lowest level was depression. And you've got like seven to nine different types of depression. So I used to believe, okay, depression is the lowest vibrational frequency you can get to before, you know, you probably, with a broken heart, pass away. But then I started to notice over the course of four or five years, looking at people who committed suicide, um, people who were suicidal, people who had suicidal ideation, or people who dabbled with the conversation of suicide, which is suicidal ideation once again. And I started to realize they all had one thing in common. Every person who either committed suicide or who had suicidal ideation, they all struggled with hopelessness. They didn't see themselves in the future. They didn't imagine themselves in the future. They didn't want to be in the future. And so I started to look into that even more. So I went back to occupations and started to look at occupations that where, where people were going through suicide, suicidal ideations overall. But I also wanted to look at the different types of fears that came into people's lives overall. Yeah. I wanted to look at what fear controls different occupations and what fear controls people to do the things they do. And the seven fears that people are controlled by when they're in a fearful electron state is the fear of criticism, which then causes burnout. It causes loneliness, you know, because people don't want to share certain things. So they suffer in silence. And I started to see that, especially throughout different parts of America and different parts of the world, if a dentist or a doctor or a physician or an anesthetist was to share with the board, that they were going through depression, they could lose their license. So there's a big fight that's been going on over the years that doctors and dentists should be able to express themselves without being penalized by the board because the board don't want to deal with being sued if something happens and doctors don't want to share what they're going through because they don't want to be penalized and lose their livelihood, lose their career, lose their titles, lose their connection with the world overall. So they would change their names and go from state to state to try and get therapy and pay in cash. And so what they would do after a period of time, they'll start to go through all different negative emotions, the fear of criticism, you know, the fear of loss, even sometimes the fear of success because more success means more business, more business means more burnout, more burnout means more pain. And so I wanted to look at occupations that were suffering with these feelings and emotions, but also wanted to look at human beings overall and what governs human beings overall. 
And these were the seven fears I was looking at. The fear of criticism, the fear of poverty, the fear of death, the fear of loss of a loved one, the fear of ill health, the fear of success, and the fear of old age. They're the, they're the main entities. And the reason why I call them entities, because they enter into your world based upon environment or based upon the type of people you're social, socialized or connected to. Sometimes it's family members telling you you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not pretty enough, you're not worthy. And so these entities start to enter into your life and start to control the way that you think, the way you feel, the way you behave, and the way you look at yourself overall, and if you even want to be successful. So these are the occupations I started to break down in the book. And these are the occupations that not only is for my research, but I looked at the NHS, I looked at the CDC, I looked at all these different organizations who can measure data on occupations that's got high stress, high depression, and high suicide rates. So as you see there, you may have your occupation on this list somewhere along the line. You know, surgeons, high suicide rates, dentists, high suicide rates, veterinarians, financial services, real estate agents, electricians, lawyers, medical doctors, farmers. I mean, 25 farmers per day in India alone are committing suicide and for, for a number of different reasons that I break down in the book. You have pharmacists and then you've got the uh, high depression rate, nurses, the amount of abuse um, and torture and pain and bureaucracy that nurses go through is, is, is absolutely crazy. I've interviewed and worked with thousands of nurses since 10, 2010, just interviewing them or talking to them or working with them overall and understanding what they're going through. Uh, also with social workers as well. Now, what was interesting for social workers, now obviously I can't speak for every social worker, but the majority of social workers from my research, interviewing them and working with them, most of them became social workers because of a previous trauma that led them into social work and helping people that were in a vulnerable place and vulnerable state as well. So they were kind of healing themselves by trying to heal other people. And the same thing I realized with police officers as well, they were going into their occupation because they had undealt with traumas that they was trying to find sense in. And so when we're looking at the behavior of a lot of police officers is because they're externally um, dealing with their internal issues. And when you're in a position of power, for obvious reasons, that's extremely dangerous. And so that's what I've been advocating for is, is to make sure that certain things are, uh, there's, there's, there's more tests that needs to be done before people go into certain occupations. Because obviously, you know, when you're in a position of power and you have undealt with trauma, it causes global issues global problems it's not just within a community or within a certain region it becomes a global problem and so i started to see that more and more that every single occupation we choose to go in the occupation vibrates within a certain frequency stress depression suicidal ideation suicidal suicidal thoughts which vibrates within a proton electron um and uh, a, a neutron um a frequency in that sense you know constituent and so I wanted to go even deeper and what's so the reason why I, I wrote this book I wrote this book for a number of different reasons I wanted to talk to five different sets of people in writing the book now the book is called who helps the helpline when the helpline needs help so that's who helps the helpline when the helpline needs help and what does that actually mean Who's helping the people that are helping the people? Because for most people, when they're in a place of servitude, now it's not just careers as well, it's family members, it's people in the community, it's your next door neighbor. Sometimes when people are out there serving other people, they're suffering in silence and the people that they're serving don't think to look back and want to serve them in return. So I, the book breaks up into five different areas when it's talking um, and explaining how to deal with traumas trials tribulations and all different things that people go through the book talks to the government about their bureaucracy so for example just like what i explained when they're penalizing a doctor because a doctor is suicidal that's the bureaucracy of it penalizing um penalizing nurses penalizing um social workers you know because they're going through certain things or they can't speak up for themselves, so they wrap them up in tape. 
the book talks to a direct person themselves. So there's worksheets in the book to help people navigate and deal with the things they got to deal with. The book talks to family members, the family members who don't know what signs to look for. So a lot of people who, you know, have suicidal ideation or who committed suicide, they, for someone who's trained and have, have knowledge, they will know that that person's preparing himself to depart themselves from the world. You know, it could be simple things like giving away possessions and saying to people, I just want you to know that I'll always love you. And just very odd behavior. That's someone who's preparing themselves, for example, you know, based upon um, the conditions, what's happening in their, their world and environment. So the book also teaches people what to look out for. The book talks to employees, uh, uh, employers about being more mindful when they are putting pressure on their staff. And finally, the book talks to the general public being more understanding as well, not being so abusive towards nurses, social workers, not being so abusive towards doctors, dentists, because that's causing a ripple effect. And sometimes people don't even realize that they're doing it as well. You know, so for example, a, a dentist, um, I talk about dentists quite a bit in, in the, a particular dentist, and I talk about dentists overall um, in the book. And sometimes we don't know that what we're passing on is secondary trauma. And sometimes we don't know that what the dentist is also receiving as well is compassion fatigue because they're causing so much pain while they're drilling your teeth that you're passing on certain energy um, over to them as well. And there's times where the patients are abusive towards the dentists, towards the doctors, towards the nurses, towards the social workers, towards the firefighters. And so they all pick up certain uh, frequencies, negative frequencies that they then take home. And after a while, it becomes overwhelming over a period of time. So I, I talk about that more in depth in the book. Okay, and, Kevin, Kevin, I'm loving the presentation, but you just got a minute left. So please, can you start to sure. wrap it up soon? Sure, 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 sure. So there's different chapters in the book. Um, talks about why dentists, firefighters go through what they go through. And it talks about the Granville um, uh, Tower fire uh, in, in the UK and what happened to the firefighters afterwards. It breaks down in the book as well. Who's helping all the different helplines, um, nurses, as I said before, and it also talks about this doctor named Dr. Pansap who breaks down the different brain systems that we have, you know, the seeking system in our brain, the rage, anger system, the fear system, the lust system, the care, the panic and the play systems. So if we want to start having our, our mastery of self, we've got to understand the different systems that control our minds. And so I talk about that as well. And then I talk about trauma, um, beauty, pain and trauma. And I'm, some of you may know this uh, pageant queen, she was absolutely amazing, but she committed suicide. So I break down why and how it happens. And then I go into um, as well, the different types of depression that you may, or someone who you may know are experiencing and going through. And then I talk about how self blame and resentment overall destroys us. And I go into a story about it and there's workshops, worksheets in there to help with that. Then I go on to help people about the five, six stages of success helping you to get to a place of excellence. It's not all doom and gloom. It's about also getting to a place of success overall. And the book goes through it. Um, it really breaks it down in finite detail. So you can find the book uh, on Amazon, or if you want me to sign the book overall, please come to my website, I'll post it. But uh, it's called, the website's called whohelpsthehelpline.com. And it really breaks down, as I said, in the book, how to get to a place of excellence away from just being in a, a dark place of despair overall and it goes into a fun thank you very much absolutely amazing that we're on here this evening um i think it's just phenomenal what you're doing as well for this international book club and as i said if you'd like to know more information please you know reach out to me on social media kevin bennett b-e-n-n-e-t-t -E -T, uh facebook instagram tiktok uh, just yeah feel free to reach out to me and uh, i'll try to accommodate you as well best as possible and um yeah that's that's me so yeah thank you very much i appreciate you guys thank you very much that was kevin bennett i'm just gonna share my screen now so you can see some of the um information about his book on display So there you heard, just heard him, author Kevin Bennett. 
the title of his book is called Who Helps the Helpline When the Helpline Needs Help. It is available on Amazon. Um, you can also go onto his website. His website is www.whohelpsthehelpline.com. That is www.whohelpsthehelpline.com. I know Kevin is um, writing the information as well into the Zoom chat in case um, you want to click on the link for those who are joining us via Zoom. But for those who are joining us via Facebook, are going to be watching the video on YouTube later. Again, the author um, of the book we just heard, uh, the author we just heard speak is Kevin Bennett. Um, the title of the book is called Who Helps the Helpline When the Helpline Needs Help? And that is available on Amazon, and you can also go on his website, www.whohelpsthehelpline.com. Thank you very much, Kevin, and um, look out very, very soon for his interview that I did as well. I recently interviewed him for the international book show, the radio show and podcast, so that will be coming out very, very soon. The best place to stay up to date about further information regarding events um, to do with the International Book Show um, is going to be the Facebook group. So if you go on Facebook and put in the International Book Show, um, you can join the Facebook group and stay up to date um, about um, upcoming events. Now, I'm now going to go on to the next author. The next author is Crystal A. Ego, and she is the author of the book called The Sex Planner. So, Crystal, if you would please like to come on, welcome to the International Book Show, the virtual book tour. I interviewed her, it may, I think, may have been a year ago, over a year ago now, maybe a yeah, year, yeah. year, year and a half ago for the the, uh, the International Book Show, the radio show and podcast. Now she's featuring on the virtual book tour. Please start by telling the audience where you're based. Very brief introduction about yourself and then, you know, tell us all about the book you've written. Okay, thank you very much. I do want to echo the sentiments of the first two authors and share my appreciation for having me back on the virtual book tour and the um, podcast. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Crystal Aigo. I am a military veteran, a mother, and a leader in the community service of Fresno. I'm currently stationed in Fresno, California. It's right in the middle of um California. A lot of people have a hard time finding it. So I created the book, The Sex Planner. Initially, I didn't set out for it to be a book. I was seeking to create a tool to help busy couples prioritize their intimacy and help strengthen their bonds. But it led me into this whole field. Now I am um, studying human sexuality for my graduate degree, and I'm now pursuing a field in sex therapy. So this book was created maybe, I had the inspiration for this book maybe two or three years ago sitting down with a therapist, a marriage and couple therapist, going over calendars, ask how are our lives are going. I look at my calendar, I see soccer practice on Tuesday and Thursday. I see a fitness meeting on Wednesday, um, another meeting on Tuesday. So the therapist asks, well, when do you have time for intimacy? A better question is, is sex, I see all these other things on your calendar, but is sex on your calendar? So that made, me, that made me think. It's like several years ago, I was like many other ambitious, um, career-oriented, family-focused women. I found myself anxious and stressed as I perpetually put the needs of others ahead of my own. When I was younger in a relationship, yes, me and my partner, we indulged in exciting adventures. We had the most soul-connecting experiences. However, as we grew older, we gained more responsibility. We have careers now, we have children now, we have positions within the community. These carefree encounters of our youth were far distant memories. My partner and I had become so consumed with adulting that we forgot to have fun and save space to re-engage our union. We began couples therapy where the idea of scheduling intimacy was introduced. This concept sparked my curiosity. I began to do more research and I discovered that this concept of scheduling intimacy and date nights and sex, it was highly promoted by a multitude of therapists. I then began, began to experience this mind shift. Through my research and through counseling, 
I also learned that the relationship with myself and the relationship with my partner, it needed dedicated time and dedicated energy. These relationships with myself and my partner, they were way too important for me to hold to the thought that they will spontaneously grow and spontaneously nurture themselves. Creating fulfilling enriching relationships, it takes intentionality. So building on this thought, my attention moved to how to make this actionable. Um, as a logistic officer, we make things actionable. I knew that planners were vital to setting and maintaining and keeping track of goals. Planners hold people accountable. They visually list your priorities. I saw many niche planners on the market. I saw planners that had focused on academics, fitness, fitness. However, none of these planners focused on intimacy. So I decided to create one. So the sex planner was designed to help busy couples strengthen their relationship. We are now in the process of creating digital versions of the planner and my special project, a self-love planner, specifically tailored to uh, African-American women. So this brand I created called Kiss Marts, it's a luxury wellness brand that centers self-love, intimacy, and audacity via stationary and digital products. How planners and journals help foster actionable steps toward discovering your most sensual self. Uh, your most sensual self. How planners empower women to recognize pleasure as a daily component to a happy, healthy lifestyle. We are a dynamic bold brand, and we are spearheading this culture shift to erase the taboo of sensual, of sensual pleasure and wellness. We aim to empower women to normalize thriving unapologetically in their sensual wellness, free of stigma, taboo, and shame. Our mission serves to close the pleasure gap by creating these tools and materials to inspire mindfulness, foster intentionality, and make wellness a priority. Achieving this, um, achieving this involves cultivating a mind shift in which these principles are embedded into daily practice. We impact, uh, we impact our readers by reminding them that their wellness is important, their happiness is important, and their birthright to pleasure is of utmost importance. Historically, and still today, cross culturally, cross culture. Women lack, uh, lack ownership of the autonomy of their own bodies. The women's rights movement and like birth control, all these things kind of help foster a sense of autonomy and liberation. But since then, women still, uh, since then women, we've been able to maintain major successes across a spectrum of businesses, um, including law, military, STEM. However, and we still also, are able to manage households. However, in spite of all these accomplishments, women remain groomed to place the needs of others ahead of their own. Vexingly, women, women's sexual, uh, sensual wellness is deemed taboo. It's tied to shame and degradation as a means to, as a means to express gender inequality. This results in a pleasure gap meaning that only 39% of women achieve satisfaction through intimacy compared to 91% of men. So as an author, um, as a creative, as a founder of this company, um, we cannot solve a, this multitude of individual reasons that surrounds sensual unfulfillment. There's just too many, like there's a spectrum of issues that individuals have to deal with. However, we do champion the investment of dedicated time to conquer these personal challenges to intimacy. By being able to mark date nights, sex holidays, and time alone, just time alone, and our planners, and being able to reflect and explore intimate thoughts in our journals, we uphold people's right to pleasure. We also have, uh, we also feed you incredible fun, adventurous tips on his journey to sensual discovery. We achieve this in a manner that's wildly uh, familiar to most women. We plan it. So I'll market, we, we market too, and we, I'll, I'll, 
the base audience of this book are women who are seeking to reserve a space in their hectic lives to deepen or establish their connection to their authentic selves, authentic sensual selves. Professional time conscious women use tools to help even break work life balances. They'll find the sex planner most impactful. We also, we are an inclusive company. However, we are very much BIPOC focused. Women charged, we're charged with a multitude of responsibilities that range from home life, business life, community service, and social engagements. So we turn to our planners to stay on top of everything. In fact, 97% of the planner market is marketed to women. But what tends to happen is we become so blocked down with all these responsibilities that we forget to save space for ourselves. Our self-care falls sideways, and furthermore, in terms of pleasure, like that's completely left off the table. So the sex planners was, was designed to permit women to prioritize this pleasure and ensure that it's important, um, mainly to representation matters. Uh, representation matters while we um, don't see ourselves in some, when we don't see ourselves in something, we begin to believe that it's not for us. And people of color, women of color, we endure too much to be led to not believe that we don't deserve sensual gratification and pleasure that's entitled to us. So the point of the sex planner, uh, the, the sex planner specifically features people of color within the planner um, it's dual purpose. It serves to foster sex positive environments and also encourage open discussions about sensuality. I do want to take a minute to read over some of the features in a planner outside of having a like a date. It's non dated. You can use the front of it, you can use the beginning of it as a regular calendar. But additional features, we feature sex holidays. A lot of people don't often know about these holidays. They include things like cuddling and compliment day, things like that. We have a section for notes. If you have like a steamy idea or a text or a picture that you want to see your partner, there's a space for that. We offer weekly um, sex positions to try. The Kama Sutra based sex position is aimed to spark excitement and imagination, but we do want you to scratch before you try a few of those. Play to the senses, help, help you design the mood and awaken your body for these experiences. Mind blown section are intimate questions. The mind is the most powerful sex tool. So having questions and, and to understand your partner a little better, those are questions for mind blown. Date ideas, of course, we want to spark their creativity. So different ideas each month on how to um how to amplify your dates. And lastly, like don't get caught. Don't get caught is mind you, the book is for busy couples. So don't get caught are, are little sneaky places to get a quickie in. That's the fun, exciting part about it. My planner can be found on the sex planner, my website. It'll soon be on Amazon. Uh, I'm still working the kinks out for Amazon, but for now you can find my books on the, the sex planner. Again, I thank you all for listening and I'm open uh, on the on the website. You can shoot ideas. You can follow me on Instagram and um, tell me what you think about it. Thank you. Okay, how can they follow you on Instagram? You mentioned they could follow you on Instagram. Yes, it's at the sex planner and I'll put it in the chat as well. Okay, cool. I'm just going to put it up on screen now so people should be able to see this. Um, the author we just heard speak, Crystal A. Ego, um, the author of the book, well, the planner, I should say, The Sex Planner, and it's available from her website. The website is www.thesexplanner.com. That is www.thesexplanner.com. Once again, so she will be putting it in the Zoom chat, but for those who are listening on, on watching on Facebook and those who are going to see the replay on YouTube, uh, the author of the book, again, is Crystal A. Ego. And the the planner, I should say, the planner is called The Sex Planner. And it's available from her website, www.thesexplanner.com. Right, I'm now going to go on to the next author. The next author is Brittany P. 
Petty, so Brittany, if you would please like to come on. Welcome to the Black the International Book Show. I, I almost feel like saying the Black Book Show is a habit. I'm so used to saying it because that's what it was previously called, the platform. Uh, welcome to the International Book Show, um, Brittany. Please start by telling us, you know, where you're based, a brief introduction about yourself, and then, you know, talk to us about, you know, the books that you've written, please. Yes, I am Brittany Petty. I am based in Texas. Um, and I'm just really excited. Um, first of all, thank you for bringing me, bringing us all on on your platform. This has just been amazing, and I'm learning so much about each person that has spoken. So I will definitely be connecting with everybody. <laughs> but first and foremost, I just want to say um, for myself, I am licensed in Texas. I am a mental health therapist, a school counselor, life coach, and an international keynote speaker. Um, and so getting to travel the world, getting to, you know, open up and speak on panels and different things like that has been just so eye opening. I'm um, taking this journey to writing a book, which has been amazing, which leads me to the books I have written. So I have one book called Stop the Drama, Stop Comparing and Focus on You, which is a book for our teen girls. Just to have a solid foundation, I realized that when I was inside of the classroom, it was just so much going on for our youth, but I noticed more specifically our teen girls were the ones who were struggling. Also having a teenager, I realized like, okay, <laughs> this is a way to be that piece or be that voice for them to give them positivity um, and just different things of that nature and being able to work with parents and so many parents are like, okay, what do I do? I don't know how to actually help my teenage teenager and so what can I do to help them and so this book is basically for teens but it's also for moms to read along with their teens to just kind of understand like what are some things that teen girls are dealing with um, when they go to school they have to deal with so much peer pressure uh, we do I think we can all agree that now raising children with social media makes it just <laughs> a lot <laughs> It is a lot. And so we all have to lean on each other. And I feel like a lot of times we are missing the village piece of being able to say, okay, it takes a village to raise our children, which it does. And so that's one thing that is encouraged for society to get back to that, get back to as a community, being able to work together to help raise our children and look out for one another and let them know like, okay, you know what? this neighbor is watching me or everyone just really wants the best for me and just really helping our youth. And that led to my book number two, Listen Up, which is a collaboration book. And this book is helping our young adults to be able to navigate the real world. Because how many of us felt like we knew everything, or at least thought we knew everything? And you get into the real world and you realize, wait a minute, I don't know everything like I thought I did. And it's just really a book to help our youth. Um, young adults, college students, to be able to learn from others' experiences. I'm in mean, life because, you know, depending on what type of childhood you had, for many, it might have been emotional. They might have been during a lot of emotional, physical abuse, a lot of trauma. And so what I have found from my own personal experiences is that you find yourself, you know, back in those situations, different people, but encountering the same things um, of abuse if you don't deal with it or recognize and know what that is. And so for me, as a mental health therapist, I talk to so many different age brackets, whether they're teens, young adults, uh, women, men. And one thing for sure is that, you know, in your 20s, you're just trying to figure it out. You're going from here to there, trying to figure out, you get paired up with somebody, not realizing that you haven't dealt with your own traumas. And then now you're in your 30s and 40s trying to figure out, what do I do next? Or how did, how did I get here? And a lot of it is a result of our foundation. And that is why um, with my book, I focus a lot on making sure that you look at your foundation, rebuild your foundation. How can you rebuild your foundation? <clears throat> Excuse me. And so that is something that we talk about a lot um, in my book. And so after being becoming the mental health therapist and really solidifying and doing a lot of research, that's what led me to start my own workbook. And my workbook is focused on inner healing, um, empower you, crown up, inner healing for women. A lot, I just basically took everything that my clients were coming to me with and just allowed them to have a safe space where they can literally break down, repair their own foundation, 
doing the work with their mental health therapist to be able to say, okay, these are some things that I dealt with. This is some trauma that I experienced. This is how that trauma still affects me in today. And start to do the work to repair themselves so that they can just have a brighter future, um, focusing on a lot of gratitude, a lot of positivity, um, affirmations, just doing different things, having that routine to really help them to say, okay, you know what, it's time for me to focus on myself. Because what happens for many is they become that person who's taking care of their children or, you know, now they're married or they're fulfilling so many different roles. Um, and they pour themselves into overworking, becoming that workaholic and just different things that people turn to realizing that it's something that they're running from. It could be, you know, not being loved properly growing up or just dealing with so much stress, which leads to burnout. And so that is why, you know, I wrote the books that I wrote based on the different experiences of where I was. So you can find my books at FocusYourSuccess.com. And again, that's FocusYourSuccess.com. And Stop the Drama, Stop Comparing, Focus on You. That is for teen girls. Uh, listen Up and Mom. And Listen Up, that book is for young adults, male and female, who are navigating life trying to figure out, okay, what do I do? Or being able to just learn from others' experiences so you don't have to make those same mistakes. Because you have a foundation and you have a guideline and a navigating post to kind of help navigate you throughout life. And then I have my workbook, which is Inner Healing, Empower You Crown Up, Inner Healing, which is focused on women. Um, because as a mental health therapist, I see a lot of clients with depression, anxiety, needing that work-life balance. And so... A lot of it goes back to the root. We go back to the root, repairing that foundation of being able to look at yourself, where are you at right now? But even further, going back, okay, let's unpeel the pieces and see what we can do to create the life that you truly desire. And just letting people know that you're never too, it's never too late for you to start over. It doesn't matter where you are right now, you can start over. And just allowing people to realize that you have the power to create the life that you desire. And it really starts on how you see yourself. When you see yourself in a positive light or that you can actually be better or be the person that you truly desire to become, then you can start to create a new foundation for yourself, set the boundaries that need to be set and start over and just create peace in your life, which is just very important. But again, you can connect with me and buy my books on FocusYourSuccess.com. And again, that is FocusYourSuccess.com. And I'll make sure I put that in the chat as well. Okay, thank you very much. That's Brittany Petty. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. So please put your details in the chat as you said you would. So Brittany, Brittany Petty, the author who you just heard speak, um, her book titles, Stop the Drama, Stop Comparing and Focus on You and also listen up so you can see a picture of a book there listen up um, a teen's guide to overcoming life's greatest obstacles and you can buy those books from the website which is listed which is www.empoweryou.company.site www.empoweryou.company.site the way how empower you is spelled um, she spelled the u with just a u instead of Y O U. So www. Empower as in E M P O W E R U. Dot company. Dot site. Uh, again, the author that you just heard was Brittany Petty, and her book titles are "Stop the Drama," "Stop Comparing," and "Focus on You," and "Listen Up." And those can be purchased from her website www. Empower You. Dot company dot site right the next author is barty Durr. i'm not sure if barty is on the zoom call barty if you're there um please let let it be known um in fact janae janae brandy so i'm gonna go to janae brandy in fact actually my mistake barty's after janae brandy um so janae janae brandy if you'd please um Come on, welcome to the International Book Show, Virtual Book Tour. For your first time, 
um please you know tell us where you're based very briefly introduce yourself and then you know tell us all about the book you've written please hello my name is Janae Brandy. Um, first, I want to say thank you for even having me on your show. This is my first time, and I am so happy. It's the honor. So glory to God, definitely. Um, my name is Janae Brandy. I'm 34 years old. I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Um, and Wichita, Kansas is in the middle of the map of the United States. Um, a little bit about Kansas is we're known for our aircraft, um, Spirit, Boeing, we have a fantastic airline. Um, a funny fact about Kansas is we're known for the Wizard of Oz, the Yellow Brick Road, Dorothy clicking her red heels. Um, I don't know anything about the Yellow Brick Road, but Wichita, Kansas is definitely my home. Um, I'm an upcoming author. I have written a book called Oaks of Righteousness. And I dedicated it to my children because my children have seen me go through different struggles. They see me go through trust issues and finding forgiveness. So I want you to imagine being nine years old and you're being introduced to multiple men, just different men stating that they're your uncle. This is a family member. You show respect to them. But with the next following day, you see those same uncles kicking your door down, putting guns to your parents' head, asking for their money. I went through that and my kids seen the hardship I had with finding forgiveness with my parents and finding healing. And so those issues caused me to have codependency, trust issues and so i wrote oaks of righteousness to show that during those circumstances there's still a way out i had anger issues at first because i was blaming others for my pain but i had to take accountability within myself and so i had to sit down and realize that this wasn't the end for me. It caused me to run to the streets and that was not the answer to go. So I had to be still for a little bit and I had to find forgiveness and healing and know that at the end of the tunnel, there is light and if I'm passionate about it to keep going and don't stop. So I definitely dedicated that to my um, children as well. And just to let everybody know that, you know, you can start over no matter how far or just the situation you were born into, that it is a turnaround. That doesn't have to be the end of your story. And that doesn't have to define who you are because of what you were born into. Um, so Oaks of Righteousness is on Amazon.com or JanaeBrandy.com. Um, and it's just to be a resource and just to be a guidance to just show that even some of the darkest times won't break you. It will make you into a better person. It gives you lessons if you look for the silver lining in it, if you look for the beauty in it instead of the pain and take those lessons and let it make you into something better and not tear you down. So Oaks of Righteousness is definitely a guide and just a, a ray of light to show that it's not over. You can always turn around, you can make a change and you can start all the way new and clear, but definitely due to healing and finding forgiveness and just know that you are worth it. So that's what Oaks of Righteousness is for. Um, you can find it on amazon.com. Or you can go to JanaeBrandy.com, J-A-N-A-E-B-R-A-N-D-Y. And it's just to show that you are important and you are somebody and you can change and make a way for greatness. Thank you. Okay, so that's Janae Brandy. Um...
Her book is titled Oaks of Righteousness, and you can buy a copy from her website. Uh, it's janaebrandy.com. Um, again, the author, Janae Brandy. You can see the picture of her book there. Um, the book's titled Oaks of Righteousness, and if you go on her website, janaebrandy.com, um, you can get a copy of the book. Um, the next author I'm now going to go on to um, is me, Sean Daniels. So me, Sean Daniels, I, I actually recently interviewed him for the international book show, the radio show and the podcast. And it was an excellent uh, interview. It's going to be coming out in case you missed it. It's going to be coming out on the podcast very, very soon. Uh, the podcast is on Spotify, Amazon, Apple Music um you know various platforms i normally share it in the the international book show facebook group if you haven't joined the facebook group please join but it was a really really good interview um but i'm now going to invite him to come and to speak on the virtual book tour so um uncle me sean um he's all he's me sean daniels also known as uncle me sean um the one and only uncle me sean so um i'm going to let him talk about his book now um i am not your black america so me, Sean, welcome to the virtual book tour. Please start by um, very briefly telling us, introducing yourself, tell us where you're based, and then go on to tell us all about the book you've written, please. Oh, you're on um, mute. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure that I piggyback off everybody else that has already spoken. Uh, thank you for giving us this platform, for being able to put this together. And, you know, you know, I'm going to have to brag a little bit. I like to say that I like to believe that meeting me caused you to change the title of your show. You know, you don't want to have to say it publicly, but, you know, I'm going to just go ahead and say that meeting me kind of contribute to that and everything. Can I get an amen? <laughs> You know, I got to mess with you a little bit, man. Our interview was off the hook. Uh, you uh, allowed me to express myself and to explain uh, why I wrote my book. My book is very controversy. I'm not your Black America. And so uh, I want to say to all everybody who's listening, is I am not against anyone who wants to identify themselves as Black. That is not what my book is all about. My book is specifically about the idea that the color construct, the paradigms and the matrix are real and they've been real from the very beginning. But culturally, my ancestors uh, came onto the uh, civilization of being able to navigate in America when the systematic system was already in place. And so, I want to let everybody understand that when I'm speaking about black, I'm speaking. I'm talking about a construct that was intentionally put into place to keep us boxed in to living the lifestyles that we're currently still living in, and continue perpetuating in because the construct is already in place before we even came in. Our ancestors could not fight against something that they themselves did not have a clue that they were in. They were only able to navigate or defend themselves against something that they were already conditioned and bred and bred into. So in my book, I specifically go into the idea of where did the construct come from. But before I go that, just so I'm, I'm a very intense individual. I'm from Miami, Florida. Um, I'm married 28 years. I have two children that I adopted. Um, I'm very proud of. Uh, I'm retired military of 21 years, and I am a retired surgical technologist of 40 plus years. I say all that because those are the things that contribute to that. My parents, uh, my mother and father, my mother uh, 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 had three men in her life, one of them identified in my book, the other one identified in my book, and the other one identified my book as my father that all contribute to my life. So a little bit about the book. Right off the bat, I start off with James Baldwin. Uh, James Baldwin, who wrote the book, I'm Not Your Negro. 
I thought it was very important to start off with James Baldwin because when I read his book, it became very clear that James Baldwin was trying to tell us something. It was like he was trying to give us a message in when he wrote his book, I'm Not Your Negro. And what I picked up out of it is that, you know, James Baldwin is gay. And he was talking about going over to all these European countries and traveling aboard outside the United States. And he noticed that everywhere he went, he was allowed to be the human. He was never judged based on the color of his skin. It wasn't until he comes back to America and he didn't go into it, but imagine you're a, you're a gay man, you're black, you have your relationships with European men, you having these relationships and after you get cleaned up, whatever you're doing, and then you go out to eat and you find out you still are N-I-G-G-E-R. You are still treated less than the people you just had relationship with. He, 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 he hinted to it how it made him feel. He like, wow, here he is in America, the country that he's born in. Pressed upon him that all he was was a N-I-G-G-E-R, the color construct reinforced over and over and over. And so when I felt that and I received that, I started realizing that through my childhood, I too was sexually abused. I too, first people who called me an N-I-G-G-E-R was my own parents, people who looked like me. The first people who actually mistreated me and hurt me and tried to kill me were people that looked like me. But all through that trauma of that, they the same people who wanted me to hate people that was outside of my culture because of the color of their skin. It was a twisted thing. The very people who treat you and mistreat you and talk to you and hurt you, then they want you to hate and be angry about people who ain't never done anything to you during my generation. Okay, I'm not talking about the previous generation born for 1960. I'm talking about I'm born after 1960. The people who hurt me, cut me, called me name derogatorily, they didn't look like white people. They look like me. And then... Those same people want me to be angry and mad about things that they themselves, their traumas and things that they themselves have not yet overcome. I don't want it. So I had to learn how to unlearn, to relearn, to see myself as God wanted me to be. And I was able to receive that in the military. And so I put in my book about the importance of first, I was transparent. I divulge some very transparent traumas that I went through. Because I believe that if you're going to be an author and you're trying to win people trust, respect, and confidence, you have to be vulnerable. So I was very vulnerable. My wife said I was too vulnerable. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't have put that in their book, but I did. I thought it was important to drop just so you can understand how vulnerable I'm making myself to you. But then I take you through the steps and learning how the paradigm shifts, learning the roots. I talk about the Uncle Tom, the, the derogatory terminologies that we constantly battled with. I talk about that. And then I talk about how I had to learn how to overcome it, to be the man that I believe God wanted me to be. Not what the world, not what America wanted me to be, but what God wanted me to be. And then I tell a story about how I had to fight to not be ashamed of being associated to Uncle Tom. The, the narrative, the ugliness that we have said about Uncle Tom, it's not even true. We have bought into a lie that ain't even true. So I'm proud to say I'm Uncle Michon, to identify to the, the false narrative of the Uncle Tom story. These are things that I realize why I say I'm not your Black. What was interesting is that the first time that I was told I wasn't black was people that looked like me because I didn't have, my mother sheltered me. I didn't have all the accolades. I didn't have the swagger of what it was to be black. And then the next person, people that told me I wasn't black is when I was a surgical technologist working in the operating room. And I had learned how to make good money. I learned how to be good. And I wanted to hang out where they were doing. 
And because I was hanging out with them, I had them tell me, me, Sean, you're not black. What the hell you mean I'm not black? Look at the color of my skin. What they were saying is that I wasn't following the construct of what being black was. Both instances was telling me, you're out of your box. What are you doing? And that's what led to me writing my book. I'm not your black, America. You know what? Accept it. I am not your black. I am proud to be identifying myself as an American descendant of slaves. The word slave, slave, this country made money off of. And they, they intentionally deceived us away from our birthplace, our birthrights, and in our inheritance. We don't have reparation. We have an inheritance in this country because we are shareholders of this United States of America. But it's interesting that they make us focus on color and not our true humanity terminology slave. I'm proud to be identify myself as an American descendant of slave. So that's a little bit about my book. That's a little bit about me. There's a little about my my passion. I hope I hope it happened. Hoping I have not overwhelmed too many people with my my passion. But I believe that my book is going to be the next book that everybody going to be talking about. Everybody going to be saying there's so much there. And then I got to push back to all my partners and friends is trying to tell me when is your next book coming. I tell everyone I have no new book coming. I put my heart into this book. I'm 63 years so I have less years ahead of me. I'm believing that I'm leaving this book to be my legacy to help the new generation that's coming behind me. So if you want to get my book, the title of my book, I'm Not Your Black America. Uh, it's been, you can go to my website, unclemeshawn.com, unclemeshawn.com. But I'm also being so, which I can brag about, I'm on uh, Target.com. Uh, you can go to Walmart.com, Barnes and & Noble. And uh, I have an audio book, which I'm excited about the audio book because I didn't narrate it, but the gentleman, my wife says, don't sound like me, but he does such a great job. Everybody loved my audio book and you can receive my book in Kindle as well. That is my rap. I am your uncle, me, Sean, come, term, coming from Louisville, Kentucky. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you will reach out. And I also want to say all six of you, I am getting a copy of your book and I'm putting it in a special place. I'm getting the book from every single, I'm going to send for your book. I'm putting it in a special place because we're all on this together. And I'm so far, I've heard some very interesting and powerful things that I'm pleased to say that I'm, I entered the international book show with you all. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was Uncle Mishon. Um, I'm just going to put his book up on display. Please put the details of where people can get your book in the uh, Zoom chat. Um, here we go. Uncle Mishon, also known as Mishon Daniels. The book title again is I Am Not Your Black America. And go, you can go to his website. His website is www.uncle mishon.com www.unclemishon.com and that's spelled as in uncle uncle mishon is m-e-s-h-o-r-n dot com again that's author mishon daniels also known as uncle mishon the title of his book is i am not your black america and you can go and check it out on his website. His website actually takes you to places where his books are available, like Amazon and, you know, different other um, websites like Walmart and I think it's Barnes & Noble and different places. That's unclemishon.com. Right. I'm now going to, um, well, I'm now going to invite uh, Michelle Cox to come on to the International Book Show for the first time. Um, Michelle, welcome onto the virtual book tour uh, this episode. Uh, please start by telling us where you're based, briefly introduce yourself, and then, you know, go on to tell us um, about the books you've written. Well, I know one's, I believe one's about to come out, and you've also got an ebook. Hi. Hi, everybody. First, thank you for inviting me. This is an amazing space, and meeting some amazing authors and hearing about some amazing work. 
I'm from, well, I live in Bethlehem, Georgia, but I'm from Boston originally. I'm 62 and I write STEM inspired picture books for children. Now, this wasn't my occupation at first. I'm in IT, I'm an instructor, and I was a field support technician for a major corporation. Well, my life came to a turn. I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 55. And after surgery, I was at home and I was contemplating if I was gonna live or die. Um, one in four black women will present with breast cancer in their lifetime. And a lot of times our outcomes aren't as good as other sisters and other people because of number one, we don't get diagnosed in time. Well, I found my own lump and that helped save my life. But ultimately, ultimately God gave me a gift because in that moment, I was contemplating whether I was going to live or die. Uh, breast cancer will make you get perspective. But God came in and God was like, I got you. And I started writing books for children while I was healing from my double mastectomy. My first book was Mommy is a Computer Smarter Than Me. Then the next book is Mommy, What is an Entrepreneur? And I'm giving away that book for free. I'm just gonna share my screen for a minute. I'm on Instagram. And then this is my website. My first book, Mommy's Computer Smarter Than Me. Now, for everybody, this is the book I'm telling you about. It is Mommy, What is an Entrepreneur? Everybody, from my heart to yours, I'm giving you this book free. All you have to do is sign up, name, email address, and the hashtag is pound BBC. That means beating breast cancer. My job, that my purpose, is to make sure that our kids learn STEM. And why not learn STEM from somebody that teaches STEM? I teach computer hardware repair. So that book is free to everybody, no matter where you are. If you have a computer, you can get it for a child you love. Now, besides that, I'm also a broadcaster. I have a show called The Importance and Power of Reading. And as somebody that is from the Black diaspora, as a Black American, I want to make sure that our kids see us the way we're supposed to be seen, the way I know that we are. And so I have a show called The Importance and Power of Reading. It's on my YouTube channel, Michelle the Computer Lady. Every week I try to get on an author, a publisher, somebody in business everywhere to share how reading has made them successful. The one thing about this life is we know that without reading, there's nothing you can do. Now, <laughs> I have a new book coming up really, really soon. And I'm doing a fundraiser because I was bought on this earth to be a good Samaritan. And part of being a good Samaritan is living my life to serve God. And I've got a new book coming up and we have a new fundraiser coming up soon. If you follow me on YouTube, Instagram, I'm also on TikTok and Facebook as Michelle underscore TCL one, Michelle the Computer Lady one. We will be launching that. Our goal is uh, for Juneteenth and the book is, Mommy, what is the acetabulum? And you give me a second, I'll show it to you. And that's the new book. And those books will be, they're available on my website, tmrcus.com. Now to all the authors, I wanna say thank you for all your work. Thank you for diving into the American psyche 
the international psyche. Also, thank you for representing to our children what it's like for us in this culture to write and to publish books. I'm wishing each and every one of you success. To everybody that's watching me internationally, you have a chance to get a book that will help your children learn about entrepreneurship. I write about mommies that teach their children about technologies, science, technology, engineering, math. And because STEM is so important, I'm hoping to illuminate a light around STEM. And that's why I write STEM inspired picture books for children as I created the Mommy Readers Collection series of books. I've written so far 12 books. I'm working on another nine right now. But my goal is to make sure that our kids are smart as they think they are. And reading will help take them there. Sankofa, thank you so much for inviting me. Everybody, much success and good luck. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle Cox. I'm just going to do um, a screen share right now. Just give me a moment. Please, Michelle, as well, put the details um, of your website, etc., your books in the Zoom chat. Um, so everyone should be able to, to see this. That's author Michelle Cox, um, her books, you know, Mummy, What is an Entrepreneur? And also, Mummy, Is the Computer Smarter Than Me? If you go onto the website, which is www.tmrcus.com, um, you'll be able to get um, you know, information about those books. That's www.tmrcus.com cus.com and that is you just heard michelle cox from the book titles mommy what is an entrepreneur and mommy is the computer smarter than me now barty dare should be joining us uh very very soon i know she's trying to log on um sister legit from nubian Legist books she's not able to make it but she sends her regards sister legit from nubian Legist books she sells a wide variety of books from black authors she normally comes on to the virtual book tour each month she's actually one of the sponsors of the virtual book tour um and the books she sells they include a variety of different themes you know some of them tackle or talk about african history pan-africanism spirituality health children's books and contemporary books so you know various different um books so um please contact sister legit you know if you're interested in um you know getting some books from her or if you're an author you may be interested in actually having her sell copies of your book so sister legit um you can contact her via email address is the best way to contact her and her email address is nubian negist books seven at gmail.com that is nubian negist books seven at gmail.com and it's spelled as in n-u-b-i-a-n-n-i-g-i-s-t books b-o-o-k-s seven at gmail.com so that is Nubian Nigist Books. Now, while we're waiting for Barty, the Barty to let me know when she's joined on. Um, I'm going to talk about my books. I wasn't planning to come on and speak, but I'm going to, you know, going to come on. Um, let me just stop my screen. Oh, no, there she is, Barty. Uh, OK, Barty, I'm going to hand it over to you. Um, please tell us, start by telling us um, where you're based, briefly introduce yourself and then, you know, tell us all about, you know, the book you've written called Worth. Hi, McConan, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me again, McConan. <laughs> I really apologise for the technical difficulties I've had this afternoon trying to log in, but uh, I'm glad to be here with everybody. Um, and yes, I've written a book called Worth. Uh, so let me just uh, try and lift it up so you can see the picture. Um, it's a picture, it's it's my memoir. Um, it got published in uh, 2021 by Hay House UK. And my memoir is about me being of dual heritage, part African, part Asian. 
So my story is about being abandoned on the roadside in Uganda um, as a two, three day old baby. And initially the newspaper said that I was an Asian baby that I had been um, abandoned. So I then got adopted by an Asian family, a Punjabi family. And actually my memoir just, uh, although I had a very loving family, um, my memoir is all about the becoming sort of becoming very aware of the prejudices in the Asian community and the African community. And the prejudices were about to, uh, me being illegitimate. So messages around, you know, the kind of background I might have come from, that I was going to be, I was going to have an end, I was going to end up dishonoring my family by having an illegitimate baby myself. So as a child, just growing up hearing those sort of messages around uh, derogatory messages about illegitimacy. Then I also heard messages about racism. And because I was part African, obviously I wasn't, uh, I wasn't fully accepted in the African community because I was half Asian and I wasn't accepted in the Asian community because I was African. So again, you know, that sort of struggle of identity, trying to find where am I in this world where, what part do I have in this world? I don't be, I, I'm not accepted in either. I was accepted by my family, but I wasn't accepted by the wider community. And people used to say to my uh, father, and my, well, they used to say to my father, people <clears throat> are going to think you've had an affair with an African woman. You're bringing great dishonor by adopting this half African girl. But they really didn't even say half African, they just said African. And I don't know if many of you are familiar with the term half caste, but in the 60s, when I was born, it, it, that term was very much used. And it's only when I became politically aware that I started to realize just how derogatory some of the terms were. And, you know, uh, so then there was prejudice about colorism. So in the Asian community, um, being f as fair as possible is really revered. So people used to, you know, growing up, hearing messages about, oh, she's so dark, she's ugly, you know, why don't you try squeezing her nose to make it seem narrower? And when I got a little bit older into my teens, I heard messages like, well, straighten her hair so she would look a little bit more Asian. So I, the reason I, I decided to call my book Worth was because I wanted to address the impact on a child's sense of worth, uh, hearing derogatory messages about their looks, their color, their race, you know. Uh, and when I was um, in my teens, I actually got diagnosed with a condition called lupus, which is an autoimmune system, um, autoimmune condition that uh, um, attacks your internal system. So then I heard messages, religious messages like, well, if you only have faith, you will get cured. You, you, you know, so the implication being that you're not cured because you don't have enough faith. Or, in you know, some of the Hindus used to say, uh, so that was from the Christian part. Then from the Hindus, I used to hear, you must have done something bad in your life. This is your karma in this current life, which I felt was grossly unfair thinking, what did I do in my past life to deserve to have a condition like lupus? What did I do in my past life to have a condition called epidermisis bullosa, which is when I was much, much younger as an eight-year-old, I developed this condition where your skin blisters. Ironically, I've got black skin, but I was uh, told I was allergic to the sun's rays. So I, I used to walk around and it used to be, if I went out in the sun, I literally looked like somebody thrown boiling water on me because I would have blisters all over my face, my skin, my hands, uh, my legs. And um, it was very, very difficult situation. People used to shun me. Children in the school used to shun me because they were worried about get, con, um, getting this condition themselves.
cells and they didn't want it. Uh, so you might, some of you may have heard of it as the butterfly skin because the skin is so fragile that not only does it blister, but it also, if you knock, if you knock it, it peels away. So um, my memoir is really about hoping to challenge people about prejudices that they might have and help, helping people to understand that sometimes you say things in company or within our community, we say things and we don't realize that children are listening to some of those things and the impact it has on, on that child's sense of worth. So we go through experiences where our worth is raised up and we go through experiences where our worth is actually shifted into tiny pieces. I mean, I had wonderful experiences with my family. My mother was incredible. Uh, my father died uh, and I'm 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 the only adopted child, and there's two siblings. I've got two female siblings, uh, two sisters, and two uh, two brothers. And I was I never really knew anything other than being totally loved by my family. But my father died when I was 10, 11 years old, and and when I was um, no sorry when I was about nine, ten years old, uh, it, at age eleven. Uh, Idi Amin decided to throw out all the Asians and when he threw us out in 1972 my mother very bravely was you know um, refused to give me up because the soldiers were ordering her at gunpoint to leave me behind because they said I was one of them and not from not not from the Asian community and um, I just remember the soldier pointing my gun, uh, pointing the gun at my mum, and really ordering her several times to leave me behind. And she, we'd actually seen a child get shot in front of us because that child was disabled. And he was saying to my mum, "If you, you know," and my mum was incredibly brave, incredibly courageous, because she could have easily said, "No, okay, you know." let's forget about the fact that she's been adopted by me. I am going to leave her behind because it's either my life and my children's lives against one life. In fact, the taxi driver was uh, sort of like looking at my mum, like, leave her behind. She's not worth it. She isn't worth dying for. But my mother very courageously said, no, she's my child and I'm taking her with me. And eventually the soldier let us go. But I just wanted you know, and I remember writing in my book and I said that that is when I actually realized how loved I was and what it does to a child's sense of worth to know that your parent loves you so much that they're willing to die for you. They're willing to lose their whole family, everybody's lives over you. And that was a pivotal moment in terms of my sense of worth because up to that point maybe I hadn't really truly believed I was loved you know I, I used to sort of in the back of my mind I used to think maybe my family adopted me but now they've got me there's nothing they can't send me back anywhere I'd end up in a save the children um uh, save the children fund children's home so they they're just tolerating me but actually I realized then that I was very much loved and it really brought up my sense of worth. Um, and it made me realize that the sort of prejudicial messages I'd received from the rest of the community paled into insignificance. I'm not going to say that it made me accept my identity totally because that, that took many years. It took many years to accept myself and it took many years to accept that I was beautiful in my own right. It took many years to accept that I had a right to be on earth. I had a right to exist and I had a purpose in my life. So it took me many years. I think I was in my thirties before I actually fully started accepting myself and I'm now in my sixties. So there you go. Um, so I'm just giving away my age there. Um, but I just want to say that, you know, my book worth, is, is literally about my journey and about my journey into the prejudice and then the acceptance and then the celebration 
of who I am and what I am. And if there's anything I want to convey to people who are listening to me, it is that we're all born worthy. And it's only circumstances and messages that we get in life that make us feel unworthy, whether it's through religion, whether it's through community, uh, stereotypical notions, whether it's through just uh, traditional um, ideas, you know, people against adoption, for example, all those sort of things are the, the type of things that actually take away that child's sense of worth. When we we're born, we're born worthy. And we have that sense of value as a baby that I'm, you know, I have a right to survive and I have a right to be nurtured and I have a right to be loved. Um, and as we grow, those sort of experiences start eroding, so certain experiences start eroding our sense of worth. So I just hope that my memoir will enable people to think, you know, um, we just have a right to be here and we have a right to accept that we do have a sense of worth inherent and not inherent in us and we have a right to nurture it if, if, if it's not just for ourselves but for our children too. So Maconan, thank you so much uh, for uh, listening to me. I just want to finish off with an affirmation that I, um, I found that really helped me. So I have just put, when I allow my self-worth to rise, negative thoughts and feelings evaporate. I believe in the power of my worth. I believe I'm worth it every moment, every second, all day and all night. And I think, you know, my book is about telling people, show compassion. Show compassion to those who are not, who are not perfect, you know, the disabled, the ones that have got conditions that you may not understand, whether they're invisible or visible, um, you know, whether you agree with somebody being adopted or anything like that, you know, um, just show compassion because you don't know what inner turmoil that person is going through. And sometimes we dismiss people because of their attitudes and we think, oh, that person's got a right attitude, but you don't know the turmoil that person's gone through or going through. So, you know, and what sort of experiences that person's had. So when I show compassion to others, both my worth and my confidence grow. And today's the day I say enough to a lack of self-belief so the roots of my worth can take hold and finally grow. And if I would encourage everybody to just pick up my book, Worth, and please read my story. Some of it is harrowing, um, especially when I talk about the soldiers. But I, was, I, I would say to you, if you persevere with it, you will, you will hopefully get a message about how I found my sense of worth, how I got my self-acceptance, and how I have finally got to the point of celebrating my worth and who I am and what I am. And that is being a strong black woman in my own right. So thank you very, very much. My book is available on Amazon and it is also available <laughs> in the UK. It's available in Waterstones and other um, bookstores. Um, WH Smith have it online. Um, in the U in the in the U USA, it's available in Barnes and Noble, um, and I don't know all the bookstores that you've got in the USA, but I've, my publishers have said it is available in in Barnes and Noble in the USA and Canada. Uh, and I do hope you'll pick up my book and and read it. And I just want to thank you very much for the encouraging messages I see in the chat, and I want to thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much, McConan, as well for inviting me thank you very much that's Barty there and she's actually one of the the um sponsors of the international book show um if you are interested in you know sponsoring the international book show or you know interested in speaking as an author if you've written a book to promote your book feel free to contact me um you can contact me via whatsapp it is 
The number I'm going to give out now is plus four four seven nine four three one seven eight double one seven. That is plus four four seven nine four three one seven eight double one seven. Um, feel free to contact me um, if you're interested in sponsoring the show or if you're an author who would like to promote your books at one of the upcoming virtual book tours in the future. Um, I'm now just going to show on screen Barty there's book which she was just talking about called Worth. Here it is. So the places that you can buy the book from, um, she's mentioned some of them, but you can get them from Amazon, Waterstones, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop.org, Booktopia and Indigo. So if you're interested in, in getting a copy of Barty Dare's book Worth, um, those are the places you can buy it from. Amazon, Waterstones, Barnes & Nobles, Bookshop.org, Booktopia and Indigo. And in fact, I do encourage you to buy a copy of a book called Worth. I did buy a copy of it for my mum on her birthday. Um, I think it was a couple of years ago now. Time flies. It's all about a year and a half ago, a couple of years ago. And she did she did commend, you know, the book. She did say it's a very, very good read. And if you actually go on Amazon and check out the reviews of the book um worth, there's a um a lot of positive reviews for the book there. So yeah, go grab a copy of the book Worth by Betty by Barty Dear. Now, as well as being the host of the International Book Show, I am also an author. I have four books that I've written, well, four book titles. Um, my books are The Rise of Rastafari, Life in Gambia, Experiences of Living Across Africa, How to Market and Sell Your Book. Now, the authors, you've, you've heard from several authors um, that have been on this episode is every episode of the virtual book tour um, many authors come to me and they wonder you know how they can market their book they need help with selling their book so the book how to market and sell your book a guide for beginners is a great resource it's a great book um, that can help with authors in terms of um, sales generation and there's different aspects of the book that I cover so in the book I talk about um, how to do successful book launch for example like all the authors that you know that have been on the platform you know I would think would, would everyone does a book launch when they're about to release a book so it talks about you know how you can um, do a book launch successfully and I'm just going to give a few tips as I talk about the book as, as I go ahead so when doing a book launch and you know doing events in general something I do recommend and I mentioned this in my book is you know doing collaborations is 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 key so um if you're say for example going to put on an event and you know it's it's at a festival where it's already that an event that's going on make sure that obviously it's an event preferably where you've got you know your target market that are going to be there so if you've written a book for example um, let's take one of my books. I've written a book called Life in Gambia, The Smiling Coast of Africa. Let's say, for example, that book is aimed about people that are looking to go, you know, on holiday to the Gambia, etc. If there's like a, you know, a, an event where I think there's going to be people in my market there looking at those at the event it may be you know an, a, an event that's you know based on you know tourism and you know or traveling traveling abroad if you've written a cookbook i'm going to go into different books if you've written a cookbook it could be you know your a, a book festival an event that's you know there's going to be um you know a taster festival where you can eat different foods etc you know if it's a a fitness book you know you can try to to find you know your your target audience and basically put on an event um when you put an event in collaboration with an organization or someone else what you do do is you also you have your audience but you also have the audience of um the other the other people that are organizing the event so for example when i released my debut book the rise of rastafari resistance redemption repatriation i did two book launches i did one book launch in luton and i did one in london um shout out to d bailey and auntie jean from auntie jean's african culture market um the event that i had in luton um i did it which was at luton um african arts and books festival the black bookcase and it was already an event where i knew there was going to be people i knew there's going to be people of my audience so it made sense for me to do the book launch in that particular event i mean if in terms of um just the economical side of things to hire out a venue can cost a lot of money it can cost like five six hundred seven hundred pounds if you're hiring in um a venue on yourself to put on an event so if you've already got there's already an event that's going on you know it could save you a lot of money by like teaming up obviously you, you might have to pay to have a store one to do a collaboration 
but it would save you a lot of money in terms of the cost that you would just entail on your own if you were doing a book launch or if you're just doing an event in general on your own. And also in terms of marketing, it means that you're already going to have a wider audience. So it's not going to be just, you know, people, your audience, your friends and family who you can sell to anytime. You're also going to have, you know, the audience of people um, that, that people that you don't necessarily know. And I come from a sales background anyway, and it's always best the way I see it is to sell. You can sell to a friend or family anytime, anytime. It's the ones that are really important and people come to my store or I meet them at an event and they wasn't going to buy a copy of Living Across, Experience of Living Across Africa. They wasn't going to buy The Rise of Rastafari. Right? They may have not have heard of even those book titles, but then engaging with them, having a conversation and them buying a the book and being able to, when you have an event where you have multiple people, what you're able to then do, you know, like this, like virtual book toys, tap into different people's networks and different people's markets. So, you know, you're doing an event, it's in conjunction with, say, eight people or even a few people. It, you know, it's more than just if you're just doing an event on yourselves. Um, again, you can always sell to your friend or family. So in terms of economical point of view, um, if you're doing an event, it's a great idea to do an event in collaboration. One, it will save you a lot of money. Also in marketing, you know, generally you can have a lot more people tend, but particularly a lot more people that are not in your top, in your market already, not in your own network, you know, so you've got a broader audience of people that, you know, that can sell, that you can sell your book to, and also that, you know, that can become more aware about your book or, you know, your brand or other services, uh, if you do, you know, sell other products on top of it. Um, and I'm going to get into, you know, how to turn your book into a business in a moment. Um, but also, you know, if you are thinking of having an event, um, and this can go away now from a book launch, or it could be an event in general, it could be, a you know, anniversary event from your book when your book was launched, or it could be that, you know, you just want to do an event to celebrate the fact that you've got a book for whatever reason. Um, if you do approach a venue, you know, try to negotiate. It could be a bar or a restaurant. You can negotiate deals with them, for example, that where they may be able to give you the venue um, for free or a discounted rate and be like, look, I'm I'm having an event here. I'm expecting, you know, 50, 100 people to come in. A lot of restaurants will, you know, happily, you know, give you like a whether it's a bar or a restaurant or a venue. Um um, so not all of them, but some were happy to agree with that because they're looking at it on terms of they're going to get business by, you know, the amount of people that you're going to are going to come through the um, the door that maybe eat a meal there that might buy a drink that might, you know, patronize their business. So that can be a win win for obviously you because you're not having to pay, you know, the, the uh, a large amount of money on hiring out the venue. But then it also can become um, a win for the business establishment because obviously they're making more sales than they would off the back of having that event than they would on just a regular day. Um, other things that I do cover in the book called How to Market and Sell Your Book a Guide for Beginners is um, how to turn your book into a business. Um, this is very, very important. Um, the reality is um, you have to sell a lot of books to, to make money. Um, but if you have a, a business um, you know, which relates to your book, that's where the money really is. The book is like a key to open the door. So what you'll find with some authors, and this, this is why I suggest and recommend a lot of authors, not everyone can do it depending on what the book is. But if you've written a book, for example, if you also have, you know, services that you can sell um, and then you'll make more money off of the services that you sell. So I'll use this as an example. Again, I'm, I'm going to use my book, Life in Gambia, the Smiling Coast of Africa. So around that book, for example, it's a book on Gambia, but I possible ways that it could turn into a business. It could be, I do consultation for people that are going to the Gambia. I do um, tours and trips for people that are going on to going to the Gambia. Yeah, so I, I could, for example, sell land for people who are going to the Gambia. These are like ways that, you know, makes money and, and it'll make probably a lot more money than, you know, just off of the book sales. So if you're, you know, I know other people do it in different fields. So for example, if you are a teacher, you know, and you're doing private tuition, you may want to do a book. Um, I've actually had someone who's a teacher and a private tuition and a um, private teacher. Um, she does tuition for um, young children and I'm, gonna, I'm using her example and she has a book, but then she uses the book, for example, you know, to complement the courses that she does. And that's really what, what it's about. People sometimes sell merchandise on top of it. Like Tamara Foley, she's one of the sponsors of the International Book Show. She's not on the platform now. Um, 
she's absent on this particular show. She's not, she wasn't able to make it um, because she had a bereavement, but um, she's really, really great because she's got her, um, her book, Cassie's Big Change and her book, Cassie's Big Change, um, she sells various different merchandise such as stationery, um, you know, and other things, you know, that, 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 that you, that you can, um, that you can purchase as well as, as well as the book. So there's various different, um, ways that you can sell additional products and by selling additional products it will it will help you to monetize um you know the money and help you to generate more money than if it was you know just on selling books um as i said mo most people you know they make more money off of the things that the extra things they sell whether it's you know additional products merchandise there's another author i know called um lyndon wizard and lyndon wizard um he's written a, a book about how he overcame di diabetes and one of the great things he does, you know, he sells various different health products. So turning your book into a business, um, that is something which is included also in the, in, in, in the chapter, um, in one of the chapters of the book, How to Market and Sell Your Book, A Guide for Beginners. There's also various other things it talks about in there, like how to use social media, um, you know, how to use social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, you know, the best ways to utilize it, Clubhouse, for example, um, how to use it strategically, how you can make sales um, off of having conversations with people. So, you know, the, the kind of techniques that can lead to sales, um, how to become an international, um, you know, author, as opposed to just seeing yourself as a local author. Um, you know, people go about their business different ways. And I, I, I've used examples of um, not just myself becoming a best-selling author, but other strategies that people have, have, have implemented to become a best-selling author. There are various tips and advice in that book. So How to Market and Sell Your Book, A Guide for Beginners, is an essential book if you're, I would say, an author and you are, um, you're struggling with sales and you want, you want to find more ways to market and sell your book. It's not only, you know, if you, just, for example, if you are, although it is catered towards beginners, even more experienced people that are selling, you know, higher volumes of books can still purchase it and they will still get benefits and it would just help them and show them even more ways to increase sales. Um, but it is, so although it is, you know, how to market sell your book, a guide for beginners, people at different levels can still, still read the book. So that's a really good book. It's available on Amazon, um, how to market and sell your book, a guide for beginners. Um, other books I'm going to go on to and talk about is The Rise of Rastafari, Resistance, Redemption and Repatriation. So this is actually my first book. I released it. It's been almost five years since I released The Rise of Rastafari. So this is a really great book. If you're interested in knowing, you know, about the history of the Rastafari movement, Rastafari it emerged in Jamaica um, in the 1930s as a group of oppressed people, descendants of enslaved Africans who tried to resist British colonial rule and established their own sovereignty. But the Rastafarians have been heavily persecuted by the government and even their own folly, fellow countrymen. Despite the vicious attempts to suppress the Rastafari movement since its inception in the 1930s, Rastafari has grown in popularity beyond the borders of the island of Jamaica and become a global phenomenon where you find Rastafarians in all parts of the world. But the original intention of the movement has been distorted along the way. In the book, myself, McCullough and Sankofa, I explained how Rastafa the original intention of Rastafari as a black liberation movement is often misrepresented as a mediocre culture. There's much more to Rastafari than just dreadlocks, smoking ganja, vegetarianism, and listening to reggae music. M McClellan Sankofa, myself, I wrote The Rise of Rastafari to dispel the misconceptions people have of Rastafari and highlight the core principles of Rastafari, such as nation building, repatriation to Africa, resistance to white supremacy, and pan-Africanism. The book The Rise of Rastafari gives key in-depth knowledge about the origin of Rastafari, which is often untold, highlighting the pioneers of the Rastafari movement, and that is people such as Leonard Howell, Joseph Hibbert, Robert Hines, Archibald Dunkley. Out of the four early preachers of Rastafari, most people, um, are, the most popular one was Leonard Percival Howell, also known as the first Rasta and the Gong. Following the coronation of His Majesty Emperor Haile Selassie in 1930, these four men began preaching Emperor Haile Selassie 
as a redeemer to come liberate black people from white supremacy and guide black people back to the ancestral homeland Africa because they've been subject to 400 years of oppression in the Western world through slavery, colonialism, neo-colonialism, racism, and cultural imperialism. The Rise of Rastafari, it, 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 it's, it's a book that points out the positive contributions that Rastafari has made as a pan-African movement, which has helped identify Africans in the diaspora, descendants of enslaved Africans with their ancestral culture, history, and roots. By reading the book, The Rise of Rastafari, um, you'll find out the different perspective um, aspects of Africa. Um, you'll find out by reading the book how Afri Rastafari has taken different aspects of Africa, such as leaders, tribes and culture, and merged them together to create a pan-African identity and culture. For example, a leader, His Majesty Haile Selassie, Emperor of Ethiopia, Nayabingi, um, which is uh, from Uganda, is Nayabingi, the, 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 the Rastafari group Nayabingi is named after a warrior queen from Uganda, Rwanda. You know, you, you have the African drum, drumming taken from places such as the Congo and throughout Africa. You have the Ashanti tribe in Ghana. So there's a Rastafari group called the Bob Ashanti, and they believe that they, they are descendants of the Ashanti tribe in Ghana. Now, we know many people of who have Jamaican ancestry, um, a, a lot of the enslaved Africans that were taken were, came from, you know, the area which is now known as Ghana today. Um, so there's, you know, a link between the Ashanti and a lot of the warrior, um, the, the the Maroons, the, the people that the fought it to resist um, slavery in the Caribbean, although they're both sides about the Maroons, but a lot of them, um, you know, were Ashanti, also known as Coromanti. They came from the Ashanti tribe in Ghana, the Akan tribe. Um, you know, people like Nani, Taki, Achim, Pong, Kojo. And that's why they have these Ashanti names. Um, you have the Mau Mau warriors in Kenya. So you see, it's common to see the Rastafari's in, in, in dreadlocks hairstyle. So it was the Mau Mau warriors in Kenya, when they were fighting their liberation in the, in, in, to get independence, it's the Mau Mau warriors that locks their hair. And then, you know, a lot of Rastafari's emulated um, that from the Mau Mau warriors in Kenya who were fighting this because they were fighting British colonialism and they were fighting to get their freedom. So the rise of Rastafari, the contents of the book include the Black liberation theology of Rastafari, right? how the movement originated, the transatlantic slave trade, post-slavery in colonial Jamaica, the link between Marcus Garvey and Rastafari, right? the legacy of his imperial majesty, Heidi Slassie, the influence of Rastafari and reggae music, the persecution against Rastafari, right? and the impact of Rastafari right? in England. So the Rasa, Rise of Rastafari is a must read for every person who wishes to gain knowledge about the history and experience of African Caribbean people in the diaspora. Again, this book, The Rise of Rastafari, Resistance, Redemption, Repatriation, it is available in paperback um, and Kindle. You can get it on Amazon. It's got 96 um, ratings, 4.7 stars. So, you know, to, to have a book to, that's got 4.7 stars, 96 ratings you know is no small feat <laughs> um and, and i don't want to sound big-headed but yeah um you know check out the reviews of the book as well it's a it's a it's an excellent book i guarantee anyone who reads the book will learn you know will learn something i'm just going to read this this review from um marlon it says amazing insight into the original black nationalist liberation repatriation and black empowerment theology that is rastafari important and vanguard work from the young line who brings a brave and profound perspective on the new faculty required to bring the movement forward. Great work. So that's the rise of Rastafari, resistance, redemption, repatriation. And I just want to say, you don't have to be a Rasta to read the book. You know, the book is universal for people to read, um, you know, um, but it's, 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 there's a lot of important information there about, you know, um, about the Caribbean, especially Jamaica, you know, Africa, particularly Ethiopia, England, um, you know, there's many different um, historical information that is, you know, that is just in the book about, you know, the legacy of Haile Selassie, about um, World War to about various different things, you know, about, you know, the persecution against Rastafari. There's a lot of, you know, historical um, things in that book. So get your copy of the book, The Rise of Rastafari. Um, also other books that I've got, I'm gonna, now gonna go on to talk about life in Gambia and experiences of living across Africa. So let me just start with life in Gambia, the Smiley Coast Africa. Um, I've lived in, the, I've been to the Gambia five times now. I've lived in the Gambia twice. And life in Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa, it 
basically covers my journey and my experience of living in the Gambia. And the Gambia is a, it's a very interesting place. It's like the smallest country on, in, on mainland Africa. Um, but there's a lot of people from the diaspora that are going to the Gambia. Um, you know, it's, it's gained popularity on YouTube, um, the likes of Black City and other YouTube channels. In fact, I was actually, while I was in the Gambia, I was working um, with a lady called Juliet Ryan on a YouTube channel called Black City. And um, at the time, it was a very popular YouTube channel. It showcased people of African heritage born in the diaspora, um, you know, Black British, you know, Caribbean, um, African American people that had uh, that had either travelled or moved to the Gambia, and documenting, you know, the reasons why they go, they move, what they're doing there. A lot of people set, have set up businesses, restaurants, hotels, and different things. And um, yeah, you know, we showcase. It's kind of like a who's who, um, a, a guide of the Gambia. We also went to places like schools, um, medical facilities. And, you know, show people uh, the, the country from the, the lens of the camera, I guess, so to speak. And, we, you know, we, in, and we got to meet a lot of influential people um, and we, we interviewed those people like ministers and, you know, big business owners. I, I was in, we went to the, the president, Adam Abarro's, his, his brother's name and ceremony. We interviewed his nephew. Um, and, yeah, so we got to, I got to kind of meet the who's who's. Um, by doing that, Black City was very popular. It inspired a lot of people to relocate to the Gambia. Um, you know, hundreds, thousands of people have either lived or are now or have even visited the Gambia uh, because as a result of that YouTube channel. You know, it, it was very impactful and it did help to put the Gambia in the map. Um, other things I did whilst I was in the Gambia, um, you know, I really enjoyed finding out a bit the different cultures. Um, and, you know, they have the tribes, you know, they have Wolof, they have Mandinka. Um, they do speak English, but they'll speak English to like me, me, or they'll speak to English if you, if you don't speak the, like, the native language. But the, the native language there is Wolof. Um, but I had great time, you know, meeting the local people. Gambia is known, it's called the, the Smiling Coast of Africa. And the reason it's called the Smiling Coast of Africa is because the people are very, very friendly and very, very, very hospitable. And in fact, that's why, I, so that's what I decided to call um, the book Life in Gambia, The Smiling Coast of Africa. Now, also what you have in the, in, in, in the book on Gambia is you have different uh, business ideas that I, that I recommended or that I suggested that you could do. So when I was in Gambia, yeah, you know, I was working with, I, was, I did a black sit, but then I was also there to kind of explore what can be done business wise. So for people that may be, you know, looking for, you know, what, what to do business wise, there's also business information. And it's a bit of an you know, overall general, I'll say, guide of the Gambia. Um, if you, in that book, you know, it tells you, you know, basically things to be careful of or things to be wary of, places to go. So, you know, for, if you are considering, um, you know, uh, a holiday destination. You, you, may, you may have not thought about the Gambia, but the Gambia is a great place to go. I mean, it's beautiful beaches, hot weather, rich culture, and friendly citizens do make it an ideal location for, for, for many people to go to. Um, there's a growing influx as well of people of African heritage born in the diaspora who have relocated um, permanently there or plans of moving there in the future. So there's a big community um, of diasporans that are over there. So you won't feel lonely. Um, the people are very receptive and they're very warm, um, you know, in, in the Gambia. So um, it's, it's very easy to, 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 to fit in, um, fit in. I mean, I first went there in 2019. Um, as I said, now I've, I've been there five times now. My most recent time I went to the Gambia was in November, but I've um, I lived there. I've spent two times where I've lived there for six months on each occasion. Um, and, you know, each occasion that I've been into the, to the Gambia, it's always exceeded my expectations. So um, life in Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa, it's... Um, it's another interesting thing about the Gambia. Um, I mean, it does have beautiful beaches, but many people are familiar with the t TV series Roots. So you can go to, you know, the main character in Roots is Kintakente, Kintakente Island in, in the Gambia. It was renamed from James Island to Kintakente Island. 
and you know it, it, you can go to you know where he was captured and where, where he was held etc um but the the gambia the smiling coat life in gambia the smiling coast of africa the book is available um on amazon um so you can get a copy of that book um and experiences of living across africa which is i'm going to talk about now which is my most recent book and experiences of living across africa is an an ethology which highlights the experiences of people who live in Africa and others who have previously lived there is from the perspective that of the move from, uh, you know, outside from the diaspora from England or America or the Caribbean to the continent, or those who have moved from one African country to another African country. Um, now it talks about my journey in Gambia, but it also talks about my time in Ghana as well. So Yes, I've I've spent time living in Gambia. I, I've lived in Ghana for six months. I've been Ghana twice. I've lived there once um, for six months. And um, a chapter is on Ghana. A chapter is on the Gambia. And then what it also has, it has other chapters in the book which have been written by other uh, co-authors and a few other people that I've interviewed. And they talk about their experiences of living in different African countries. And the countries that it covers in the book include uh, Ghana, Gambia, Rwanda, Ethiopia, Zambia, South Africa, Senegal, Egypt, Tanzania, Sierra Leone, Tunisia, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and Kenya. And the reason why I wanted it to have, you know, a vast um, amount of different African countries is because I didn't want it to just be on, you know, say West Africa. I wanted it to also have, you know, North, South, East. Um, and with the book, it has articles by men and women from different walks of life. So it features people such as princes, the son of a famous civil rights activist, those that assist in relocating to Africa, tour operators and guides, authors, media experts, former students, and a retiree. So the book is focused on 14 nations situated in different regions in Africa, North, South, East, and West. And through reading the book, you'll get a better understanding of what to anticipate and consider when relocating to one of those African countries. So the book is really a great resource um, for people looking to move to Africa, and also for those you know eager to learn about the customs and cultures of different African societies. Additionally, the book can also be used for those researching for a place to visit on holiday. So, um, yeah, if you haven't, you know, thought about visiting one of the 55 African countries, if you get a copy of the book and, and read about some of the countries included, there's a lot of in-depth information and all the information is written by people there on the ground, you know, or there that have been there on the ground. The criteria for the book was that people had to have lived in an African country that they're talking about. They need to live in there for um, a minimum of six months. Um, you know, I think the average is six months. Um, some have been living there for over 11 years. Some are still living there. Some three years, five years, seven, um, you know, seven years, eight years. But I wanted it to be not that you've, you know, gone to African country and you spent two weeks on holiday or you spent a month on holiday because you don't really know a lot about the country then. I wanted it to be like people that have been there for living for a certain, were well, living there and also been there for a substantial um, amount of time. There's a chapter in the book called Things to Consider When Moving to Africa. Um, and that is a very, very important chapter as well, particularly for those who are looking to relocate to a country, because although every African country and even within African countries, you know, it, it can be it can be different from one place to the other because of the different ethnic groups, the different tribes, different cultures, the different way they do things, the different languages. Yeah. It's, it's, but you, there are things in which are generally still this, that apply to one African country that also apply to other African countries. Um, so when you look at things to consider when moving to Africa, and there's things you need to consider regardless of what country you're going to. Uh, you know, one of the first thing you need to consider is if you are moving to African country, is what country you want to move to. You know, because there's 54 countries, and one person it might be Ghana, or one person might be the Gambia, might be Egypt. It depends what you what you're looking for because you know we're all di we are all different people. So what might suit one person might not suit the other person. Um, immigration is something that you know you need to consider um you know how to legally immigrate into the country um how much money you need to move with you know how you're going to ship over um things to the country where you know whether it's a shipping by a container for your goods 
or whether you're going to ship a car abroad, something that catches a lot of people out is, you know, the imp in, uh, the tax, the um, the import tax that they have to pay at the, the port, um, how you'll be getting income, you know, whether you have a pension, whether you'll be having a business, um, you know, these are things to, con to, to, to consider whether you're going to remote work remotely online, um, community, friends in your network, electricity, you know, um, a lot of people that live in the Western world are, are used to having 24 seven electricity, you know, electricity and water shortages in Africa is not, uh, you know, is depending on where you are, um, you know, it varies, but you know, electricity going off is common. Um, internet connectivity, you know, particularly if you're working remotely, having a stable internet connection, um, but there's many things that the book talks about online banking, you know, how to take out money from a foreign account when you're abroad, um, you know, school fees if you've got children, you know, because a lot of people from the diaspora, they like to send their children to international schools or private schools. But, you know, they're very expensive in, 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 in Africa, very, very expensive, um, you know, imported products. You know, you may want to have to alter or change your diet or the things you buy because if you're used to buying products and goods from that are made in you know the diaspora like England America or things that are shipped from abroad you know it's a lot cheaper to buy the local products and the local goods um you know one thing that I found with the Gambia is that exports so if things imported there are expensive but very very expensive you know you can pay a lot of times imports like double the price that you'll pay on something in a supermarket here um you know that's that that's common and it's not just in the gambia it's in other african countries so what i what you'll find is you know if you can buy things that are manufactured in that country um and not just food but whether that's medical um products you know whether it is furniture whatever it is you want to buy that you you know you save a lot of money in generally by buying the local produce um but experiences of you know of living across africa um it, it it's, it also has interviews. I mentioned it's got articles. Um, it's got a few people that I interviewed um, in the book as well. Such so one person is Osman Toure. And what's interesting um, with some of the people that are in the book, like Osman, for example, he moved from one African country to another. So he's a Gambian and he spent time studying Rwanda. Um, you also have uh, Yaya Toure, who moved from Guinea um, to Tunisia. Um, Prince Mega, um, who moved from, well, he's been a Nigerian, but he went to South Africa. So it does capture the diaspora experience of those coming from, say, America, England, the Caribbean, you know, who, who's, who've got, you know, descendants of enslaved Africans, who've got African ancestry. But it also has those on the continent that have been from one African country to another African country, which is an interesting experience as, as well. So... Experiences of living across Africa. Um, yeah, get a copy of that book. It's available in paperback and Kindle. Um, if you go on Amazon, um, you know, it's worldwide on Amazon, you can get a, a copy of the book. And I thoroughly do yeah, recommend getting a copy of Experiences of Living Across Africa, as well as I do in my other books, you know, How to Market and Sell Your Book, A Guide for Beginners, The Rise of Rastafari, Resistance, Redemption, Repatriation, and... Life in Gambia, the smiling coast of Africa. So the, the book Life in Gambia is really, um, although I talk about Gambia and experiences of living across Africa, the, the book in on Gambia is just a book just solely on Gambia. And that's just a more, it's basically just a more in-depth book, whereas experiences of living across Africa, it has Gambia as one chapter, but then it has all the other, you know, African countries as well that are, that are covered in the book. But if you are specifically interested in the Gambia, then Life in Gambia is for you. But, you know, if you want to also know about the other African countries, um, experiences of living across Africa. Right, we're coming to a conclusion of the International Book Show. Before we go, there's just a few things that I want to um, state. Uh, please join the Facebook group. If you haven't already, uh, join the International Book Show Facebook group. Um, this video of the virtual book tour will be available to watch in the Facebook group. So you can go back and watch it literally for, as soon as you know the, the, this, this finishes, you'll be able to go back. It's available to watch. Please share it as well. Um, and, you know, updates on general information about virtual book tours and the authors that are featured on the platform. That's the place to go. Um, the, the Facebook group. Um, I've got an upcoming radio show on this Wednesday on Pam Tango Radio. Um, I broadcast on Pam Tango Radio, the international book show, the radio show and podcast. The radio show is biweekly every other Wednesday between 8 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. Um, 
this particular um, show, I will be interviewing uh, Prince Mega. Um, and he's one of the co-authors of the book, Experiences of Living Across Africa. And he will be talking about his journey um, in South Africa. He lived in South Africa for seven years. Um, he would tell about us what he did in South Africa. Um, then he went to Gambia. Then he's now um, with his family in Nigeria. So um, that's going to be an in-depth interview that I do with Prince Mega. So it's, listen to that show. Um, yeah, coming up again. If you're on the mailing list, you will get a notification via email. Um, if not, keep up to date, please, by the International Book Show Facebook group. And a reminder to join us on the International Book Show uh, next month. Next month will be on Sunday, the 26th of May, where there will be um, another variety of authors that will be talking about their books. So please join me um, again. Uh, a reminder as well, this video will be going on YouTube. It will be going on P English Literature YouTube channel, which all the videos, you know, um, of the virtual book tours, they go on to P English Literature YouTube channel. At this point, I would just like to thank you. So I'm just reading a message in the chat. So I'm just going to leave my number to that person. OK, so I've put my number in the chat. Um, also, if you do want to contact me, if you're all for about featuring on the International Book Show, I know I've had a couple of messages whilst I've been speaking. Um, feel free to reach out to me on WhatsApp. The number is plus four four seven nine four three one seven eight double one seven. That is plus four four seven nine four three one seven eight double one seven. Thanks again for joining me on this edition of the International Book Show, regardless of where you're joining us from the in the world, whether it's Africa, the Caribbean, um, you know, Europe, USA. Um, big thank you for joining us. Thanks to all the authors for featuring on the show. And I just want to say goodbye. And hopefully you will see me again next month. Remember, next virtual book tour, Sunday, the 26th of May. But well, this is McConnell Sankofa signing off of the International Book Show and saying goodbye, everyone.